Good morning, Pastor Chase here, and we are glad that you are here. Welcome to Anthem Online. Uh, a lot of good things today during the service. A brand new worship set at gorgeous Green Oak Ranch. The music is incredible. The scenery is beautiful. Can't wait for that in just a moment. Also, we're continuing our Unstoppable series in the book of Acts. So grab your Bibles, a pen, and get ready to mark it up. Before we dive into both of those things, here's a couple announcements for you. The first is we've started corporate prayer every Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. Uh, it's been really powerful already. This will be week three of it, and it's going to be every single Wednesday thereafter right now. And so join us one of two ways, either in person at Green Oak Ranch at our offices, or you can join us if you don't feel comfortable with that by using the Zoom link, anthem.prayer. You don't need a Zoom account. Uh, to use that link and to jump in because we have one. And with that, we'd love for you to join us. There's no structure, 6.30 to 7.30. It's just us praying. Praying for what? Well, whatever's on your heart, whatever God leads you to. And as we pray together, we believe that, that prayer isn't just for the work, it is part of the work. And so we want to be a church that prays together and, and believes in the power of contending for our country, in our community, in our church, um, corporately. And secondly, I want to let you know that we have Anthem Life Groups coming up. At the end of this month, we'll be launching new groups, and uh, we'll be also opening up groups that currently exist that have spots available. If you're interested in more information about that, uh, pay attention as October ends and November begins because we're going to be opening up and announcing those groups. We're going to be, just so you know, uh, putting them on our website and also we're going to have um, in person, we'll have a sign that shows where they are, what day they are, and so you can really be praying about what group fits your schedule and your needs best. With that, enjoy the worship service. I can't wait for you to see this set. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, is my song. For you are king. The king of my heart be the wind inside my sails.
singing over me You have been so, so good to me Before I turn that You breathe your life have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. And I couldn't earn, and I don't deserve it. Till you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Yeah I was your foe, still your love far from me. And you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all. So, so kind to me And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it Till you give yourself away and Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Yeah Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow, there's no shadow you won't light Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me And oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God And oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found
I scan the room in panoramic In a stadium of dry bones reflected But that ain't reflective of a grander planet and Made perfect amongst our imperfection And so it ain't the sin nature within that keeps us from progressing Must be something else, something more Right beneath our noses a glimpse of heaven opens Every time that word of God is spoken Every time we get the smell of bread and wine, it is so potent. Every time a sinner repents and we dunk them in the ocean. It's in our grasp, but we've halted to a standstill. We talk big, but removed our shoes and walk with anvils. A talking landfill that parallels the first church in all the wrong ways. Making masters out of money makes us slaves. Sapphira, Ananias, the list goes on and on, but the gospel still was spreading all along. So ask yourself, why does it feel like this church can't find a pulse? To put it simply, we focused on ourselves to find results. So you can rest and feel the pleasance of knowing that this kingdom is advancing any time the spirit's present. Uh. We never place our faith in politicians Follow the mission Regardless, know he is sovereign in it And they all are gonna bow Every living thing that breathes They all are gonna bow See the clouds open and hear that thunder loud You're welcomed in this place We're calling on your name, I know you hear it What makes an unstoppable church? To put it simply again It's one that is accompanied by the Spirit WWJD. Remember those cool bracelets? Did you ever wear them? Did you ever cite it to your friend? When you wanted to have a really spiritual moment. Nowadays we call those Jesus jukes. Jesus juke is when somebody brings up Jesus when you make a sarcastic response or ask a dumb question and they give you a really spiritual answer. Maybe even cite a Bible verse. What if I told you that if we were going to follow the rules of the bracelet, WWJD. What if that meant that you could walk by somebody that was in desperate need of healing? Acts chapter 3. You got your pens? <laughs> I know. Before you call a heretic, follow me to the end. You ready? Acts chapter 3. Here's what it says. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to, be get, to beg from those going into the temple courts. See what I did there? We've been in a series called Unstoppable, and it's all about unstoppable, uh, an unstoppable church. Now we, we've seen unstoppable forces all in different areas of culture, right? So think about sports right now. The Lakers just won another championship. LeBron James, the debate increases LeBron, is he the GOAT or Jordan the GOAT? All I know is both have been unstoppable forces in basketball. One won four championships in 10 tries, the other six for six, so you know where I stand. But nonetheless, unstoppable forces in basketball. You can talk about unstoppable forces in, in other athletics. Right now, the Dodgers are competing for a World Series. They seem to be pretty unstoppable until they met the Braves. Now the Braves are up 2-1 as we speak. By the time you watch this, I don't know what the series will be unstoppable. We're talking about an unstoppable church, right? Something that marks unstoppability is something different, set apart, right? We call it holy. It's what makes God unstoppable. But an unstoppable church, as we talked about last week, is marked by the Holy Spirit, which is the indwelling of God. So as we talk about that, I want to enter into a more practical conversation because the text leads us there. And that is that Here's a guy who it was lame at birth, sitting at the temple gates. Now, who went to the temple often? Jesus. So it says he went there every day. Now, is that hyperbole? Maybe. Is that letting us know as, as the reader, that the writer wants us to know that people have passed him by? Have Peter and John passed him by? I don't know. All I know is it's an interesting question. We're going to get to the practical application with that later, but it hones in that WWJD moment. If we're going to be like Jesus, 
when we follow Jesus, just hold on to that because I think we're going to put a bow on it later. Check this out. Verse 3. When he asked, I'm sorry, when he saw Peter and John, this is the beggar, about to enter, he asked them for what? For money. So he doesn't even ask them for what he really needs. He asked them for physical resources. Pay attention to this exchange. The words are very interesting, and I think the application can be easily missed unless you pay attention to the details. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Oh, there's so much in this text. Peter gives the man his attention. We're going to unpack that more later. You think about even your encounter, my encounter with the homeless. I I think at some level that would probably be our best modern day illustration of the man that we're reading about. That something has drove him to be rejected by his whole family, right? Because remember, homelessness isn't just not having money. It's not having the people to fall back on that leads you to the streets. Now, we don't know every story, but the truth is when we see a homeless person, we know there is a story. And oftentimes, for whatever reason, we can't even make eye contact. You ever done that? You ever felt that? You ever experienced that when you see a homeless person? You can't even make eye contact. It's maybe because it's fear related, maybe because it's you don't want to feel the shame of not being able to meet that need. I don't know what it is, but here in this moment, Peter shows us this first step to loving somebody. Boom, eyes. You see, Jesus paid attention to Peter. When Peter rejected him, Jesus fixed his eyes on him and then redeemed and restored him back to ministry. And now Peter is paying it forward. W-W-J-D. Eyes on me. He sees him. And then the ask is for money. And yet Peter sees the man is expectant. Don't miss that. But he doesn't give him what he asked for. Verse six, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. So it's Jesus's name that has power, not Peter, but it's the man that gets up and walks. Can you imagine being here in the scene? The chaos, the the crowd, the noise, the murmurs, the, the people that don't go to the temple because there's a story to tell. Watch what happens next. He jumped to his feet, I'm sorry, taking him by the right hand, verse 7, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Like, think about even just this wobbly, like thinking about a toddler learning how to walk, right? It kind of looks like they, they had a late night drinking, right? Like they're, they're kind of stumbling. So imagine this guy hasn't walked his whole life, right? And his, his feet aren't strong yet. And as he stumbles to walk, all of a sudden, all of a sudden his ankles grow strong. And he starts to walk. Imagine seeing this, experiencing this. And yeah, it's kind of funny to think about a grown man learning how to walk, but it's also unbelievably beautiful. And I think it's one of those stories that when you see it, your jaw would drop. And then when you tell the story, you're probably giggling because there's a moment where it's funny and yet so powerful at the end. And man, that would be a campfire story for years to come, wouldn't it be? But it's not just a campfire story later. It has a deep impact right now. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went uh, with them into the temple courts. So, so you talk about why we worship, why we gather. Like on Sundays, the purpose of when we worship is, is not that we've been dormant all week long and then we come together and we're like, oh, I need to be refreshed because I forgot what Jesus was all about. No, the real reason we should gather and worship, like the prime time reason is that we've been so engaged in the activity of God that we can't help but gather and worship to, because we've seen what he's done. So after he's healed, he goes into the temple courts. What better place to go? What better place to be? Walking and jumping and praising God. Can you imagine for however many years, 20, 25, 30 years, this dude can't walk. He longed for the days, dreamed. How many dreams does he have of walking, just being normal? Like you and I dream of of all kinds of things. This guy just wanted to be normal, wanted to go to the market, wanted to get squash. I don't know why I said squash, but that's the first thing that came to mind. He just wanted to go to the store. And now elated that his feet work, that his ankles are strong, he's jumping. And you and I, grown men don't jump, right? And if we do, there's a ball in our hands. 
But here he is acting like a fool. Why? Because he can walk. I love this story. When all the people, so it's not just about the man that is healed, it's about what the people see. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with, say it with me, wonder. You ever watched a toddler in a new environment? They're curious. They grab everything. They touch, they yell. They're even two toddlers together. They're trying to be even curious about friendship and curious about relationship. There's so much curiosity. And as we get older and responsibility and curiosity, because they don't intermingle, we choose responsibility. And yes, there's a natural reality there. But man, when we use lose wonder, I think we lose an aspect of what we've been created for. I love this story because it takes a, a beggar who couldn't walk being healed for adults to experience wonder again. What does it look like for you and I to experience wonder? I have no idea. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm here to help. And amazement at what had happened to him. Peter will then go on into a sermon, a sermon similar to what he preached in Acts chapter 2, different crowd, but similar experience in that he confronts them again, right? The Jews were the people that put Jesus on the cross, literally. The same crowd that followed him also called for him to be executed instead of a criminal. And so Peter has to have several conversations, confrontational conversations, where he confronts them with their sin, confronts them with the execution of the perfect man. And in doing so, people repent, which means they turn their lives, which means they were they were walking away from God, rebelling God, rebelling against God, rejecting God, and now they're walking toward Him. That's all repentance is. It's a fancy Christian word that says, you were going one way and you turned your life around and went the other direction. Man, there's so much application in Acts chapter 3. You can read the rest of it to see how the, the miracle led to a sermon that led to repentance. I want to spend some time, though, unpacking what I believe is really helpful. So if you're thinking, okay, how does this apply to me? That's what this sermon's all about. You are, we're gonna take ancient text and we're gonna cross over the bridge to the modern context and ask ourselves, so what, now what? Here's the first point of application for today's sermon. It's that stories of healing lead to people following Jesus. Now here, if you're watching one of two things, or maybe both, you can apply this. The first is if you need healing, that's available to you. The power of Jesus healed this man. And how did that come? It, it came from somebody sharing that power with him. And in doing so, the guy jumped up and praised God. So if you need healing, man, we would love to pray for you. In fact, every single week, you can, you can email us, info at myanthemchurch.com, share a prayer. We would love to pray with you. In fact, in the announcements, uh, I shared with you a time of prayer where we can pray together. Let's believe that the power that raised Jesus from the dead still is alive today in you and me. Let's pray together for the things that need healing, whether it's big or small, whether it's legs that don't work or a heart that's broken, let's pray for healing. And then when we experience it, we're gonna tell those stories. Every chance we get, we're gonna share those mamma jammas with anybody who will listen. If you have a story of healing, big or small, we're gonna find somebody who will listen. We gotta figure out how to tell those in 30 seconds, five minutes, 30 minutes, around a campfire, in the line at the grocery store, in an awkward parking lot conversation, whenever, however, I don't care what it looks like because when we share stories of healing, that leads to people following Jesus. That's what happened when Peter healed the man and the man got up, praised God, and then Peter preached a sermon and people repented. Why was the sermon powerful? Because it was connected to a story. Share your story of healing. And I'm convinced if you lived a life of storytelling, people would follow Jesus because of what Jesus did in you. Number two, if you paid attention to the small details of the text, you would know that your most valuable resource is not money. Your most valuable resource is not money. In fact, 
That's what the beggar asked for. I wrote it this way if you're taking notes. Your resources are not what's most valuable to people. Rick Warren has a beautiful quote. Let me read it for you in regards to this. The best use of life is love. The best expression of love is time. The best time to love is now. I think oftentimes we, we think that it's our money that people need. And in some cases, it is. We see that in the Gospels. So sometimes it's a physical need. Like if, if somebody in your group says, hey, will you pray for me? I don't have enough money for groceries. And you're sitting there and the Holy Spirit prompts you like, hey, yo, you've got enough money in the bank account. In fact, remember I gave you that extra hundred bucks? This is the time, use it, leverage it. That's when you use your resources. But generally speaking, your Reese's, Reese's? That sounds good right now, peanut butter, chocolate, all that. But your resources isn't what's most valuable to people. It's your time, it's your attention, it's your care. It's your friendship. And if I'm honest with you, you can always make more money, but you can't make more time. You get 24 hours in a day and shoot, we don't even know when that runs out. And so, what if we leveraged our most valuable resource to care for the people in need? What if it wasn't about money most of the time? What if, a, what if it was just about you and I being attentive? Now, if I'm honest with you, I wrestle with this a little bit. Like, the, there's a tension with time, isn't it? Isn't there? And here's my question. How do you manage the tension of time? Now, if you're wondering what I mean, if we're called to love our neighbor as ourself, in, in our culture, time matters, right? So if I'm late for a meeting, the person feels disrespected. If I continually miss meetings, I don't feel like a very loving person. And, and, and here's the litmus test for me and why I think there's a tension. I'm going to teach my kids to keep a calendar. I think that's responsible. I'm going to teach my kids to be on time. I think that's respectful. I'm going to teach my kids to prioritize their time. I think that's wise. Why? Because a lot of those things culturally are just relevant. And so we need to keep a calendar. We need to be on time as best as we can. And yet, we need to have margin in order to see the people that are in need and have time for them. How in the world do we manage this tension? I've got a couple tricks and tips that I think will help us. Because the truth is, this is the question of our day. There are so many needs. In fact, you're hit left and right with them. In fact, so many needs that it's created something that's commonly known as compassion fatigue. I like to call it empathy exhaustion. I want to ask you a question about compassion fatigue or empathy exhaustion. Have you experienced empathy exhaustion? Here's why I ask that question. Think about it, social media, Facebook, the news. Think about your friends, right? Every single night of the news, it's what's, what went wrong, right? The kid that was kidnapped, terrible, horrible, heart-wrenching. There's the war that exists all around. There's the natural disaster. There's the, 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 the race stuff in our country. There's the election. There's, there's the homeless guy down the street. There's the, the homeless problem in Los Angeles. I mean, I mean, literally, I'm just hit like six or seven local and national conversation points. We can go on, on and on and on. Turn on the news tonight. If you don't know what empathy exhaustion is, watch the news for the next seven days. Actually don't, because I'm not prepared to answer the phone call when you have and experience this for the first time you mentally will probably fall into anxiety or in depression. In fact, it's why it's so high right now. And so this exists because there's so many problems and we feel responsible at some level to do something about it. That responsibility is a great thing, but it's led us to deal with empathy exhaustion in either a sinful or an unhealthy manner. Now, a sinful manner is when we get prideful. It's when instead of dealing with the needs, in our community, we have strong opinions about how others should deal with the needs. That, my friends, is pride. And oftentimes, it's a mass because we want to do something, but we feel overwhelmed. That's sinful. And if that's you, and if I'm honest, that has been me at times, I've got to repent of that. I've got to turn my life around. 
Not judge others for what they're doing or not doing, but rather ask God, what would you have me do? And then I've got to make the problem small, right? If there's so many problems, and I'm not Jesus, I am bound by limits. You know how I know that? Because last night I went to sleep. (laughs) If you slept last night, you have limitations. If you didn't, you need to see your doctor. It's really important that we understand that there's limitations all over the place. We're not Jesus. We want to be like him, but we, we don't have the full capacity that Jesus lived with. We need sleep. We need food. We need water. We need friendship. We need a lot of stuff. And if we don't manage that well, then the as yourself in the greatest command becomes something that we're not a very good person at loving somebody else. And it And a lot of that deals right here with empathy exhaustion. So how do we take the massive problems of the world and make them small? Here's what I would recommend for you and for me. Let's worry about the problems in front of us. Who is right in front of you? Who needs your time? Who maybe needs some resources? What's the thing that God's calling you to? Going back all the way to my opening illustration, when you thought I was a heretic, what if Jesus walked by the beggar? What if he was at the temple gate called beautiful multiple times and Jesus walked right by him? Now, I don't know if that happened. Peter and John probably did though. Jesus may have. Here's what I'm telling you that there's other stories where with Lazarus, Jesus doesn't even show up on time. You see, because the tension here is that not every need has your name on it. It can't. And if you think it does, you're trying to be Jesus. And you can't. And when we try to be Jesus, not in a healthy way, but in an unhealthy way, we get a savior complex and the pride ushers its way to the foreground. And then we treat people cruddy because we think we have it all. So back up. Let's stay dependent on Jesus because his name is the one that has power. Let's focus on the needs in front of us. Who needs healing? Who needs help? And let's begin to live out of what's right here. There's so much noise, but maybe it's time to get off of social media. Maybe it's time to turn off the news and say, God, what needs are outside? What needs are in my neighborhood? What needs are across the street? There may be a widow, right? And true religion is loving that widow that just needs you to take out her trash can because maybe over time she's just gotten to the place where that would be a huge blessing to her. Maybe there's a single mom that just needs some groceries, right? Maybe there's a friend that just needs a cup of coffee. Maybe there's a, your dad who just needs a son. I don't know what the need is, but I just know that if we focus on what's in front of us, and turned off the noise that's all around us. And we began asking the question, God, what would you have me do right now in this moment? Knowing that time is precious, knowing that the greatest way to use our time is to love, and knowing that in the context of our culture, there's a limited amount of it. And part of love is being responsible with it. There's a tension there. Attention that I think that maybe today you spend some time praying about. And when? And when you pray about it and wake up tomorrow, remember, you've got a story of healing. And every time you share that, it's an invitation for people to follow Jesus. Out of today, into forever. A lot to wrestle with, my friends. But I pray as you read Acts 3, you'd be challenged, encouraged, and ready ready to serve, ready to love, and ready to share the story of healing you've experienced. We'll see you next week.